we should now be live. Welcome to episode nine of International Expansion Explained. And today I've gone a really long way from home and crossed to what at home would be called north of the river so that I can talk to that Yorkshire lass. <laughs> so she was the youngest of, of four kids with a mum who was widowed when she was four. That meant that they played out mm -hmm. on the streets till the lights came on. But she did well at school. She's a nerdy, or she was a nerdy, nondescript kid with glasses and a distinct <laughs> lack of filter. So that meant that she had a pretty happy childhood, surrounded by a lot of love, maybe not that many riches, but a lot of good fun and camaraderie. So it's given Susan the base to know that the little things in life are really important and that you have to be good to others. And you also, it means you've got to work hard for what you have. So if we look at her career, it's been a pretty eclectic mix. She's been a civil servant, a fille au pair in the Swiss Alps. She started a bakery in France, been involved with brake pads, PTFE hoses, a police member of staff, customer service and back to sales. She loves home and dogs and feels that nothing beats a good saunter up the hills of the Scottish borders. Blissful evening for her is a cheese platter with red wine and some dark Nordic depressed subtitled series on, <laughs> on the goggle box. So, Susan Brown, I'm very pleased to welcome you on to International Expansion Explained. Thanks for being here. Hi, Catherine. Oh, I'm really pleased to be here. I didn't realise you were reading that all the bio. That's really nice. People will get to know who I am. Thank you. Well, I just figured you've got to let them know who their victim is of the day. If they're going to start heckling, then they should know who they're going to heckle at. <laughs> That's so <okay. laughs> So, having listened to all of that, what was it that that kind of inspired you first of all well I guess your first forays into international were as an as an au pair but mm -hmm. what got you into international business or what was it that drew you away from God's own county? God's own county says the lady from Bomber County. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let me think well yes initially my interest I mean I liked holiday and I went to a few the Baltic states when I was younger um I traveled around around a bit everywhere you go you get by in English I just thought why do we get by not in France know? sorry not, not in, in France <laughs> no not always well you'll, you'll get ripped off in France if you don't speak any French uh, so it just I just wanted to learn another language and the field pair thing came up. Actually, do you know I put an advert in a magazine called The Lady Magazine? I got some really strange replies. One from a boarding school. I specifically wanted to go to Switzerland. Uh, anyway, I ended up, ended up there. But the, so international business followed because of the language, I think. Um, when I came back from France, we... Uh, I got a job in, in the in, from Intex brake pads in the TMD friction now. Um, and if you like, it was because I spoke French, but I wasn't taken on for someone speaking French. It was just, you know, could help out with the Algerian customers, with French customers, not, not a technical translator or anything. Um, and, you know, once you've done that, you know, once your collection of mugs from the sales reps, as they used to be called, that were going abroad. Once your collection of mugs starts growing, you can't you just can't leave it. That is very true. And you also, I guess you also, you get kind of addicted to it, don't you, to talking to all of those um, different people. I mean, I remember my first company, I was also, I think one of the reasons they took me on was that they'd been bought out by a, a French company. Yeah. And so when the trucks used to turn up at the, at the office door rather than at the warehouse door with the French truck drivers. I used to be the one who got sent out to go and give them the instructions as to where the, um, you know, where the loading bays were and where they needed to, um, to be going. So. And it's a particular thing, isn't it? Because a French truck driver knows how to drive and of course he'll have, he is a truck driver. 
He knows yeah. how to drive a truck and he'll know how, how to get through customs and what he needs to say on the ship. But you bring somebody outside of that arena of, of knowledge, it's gonna they're gonna sort of they're gonna be a bit way laid out in, in what they know. So brilliant, I love that. Yeah. So what was it in the end that brought you into kind of languages services? Because I know you've worked in quite a mix of companies doing different things and and different areas of, of business, but then languages service providers might seem an obvious one, but it wasn't the first stop for you. Oh, no, definitely not. But I, I wish it had been a stop sooner. Um, you know, there's so much to learn. And at first I thought, oh, I'm going to be so overwhelmed. But you, you get there with the right people behind you. And it was, by, it was a hazard, really. I was working for a transport company and thinking, oh, where am I going? Is it that good? You know, it's not very glamorous, is it, transport? I know. No disrespect to everybody in the transport industry. I just wanted something different, you know, a different challenge. And someone, so I got in touch with some people on LinkedIn, as you do. As you do, yep. Yeah. Because <laughs> it is a recruitment plat platform at the base. Um, let me think. Yeah, so a lady got in touch with a recruiter. And do you know what the funny thing is? I did, and I said that I was interviewing my MD the other day for, uh, for a LinkedIn post. And... I was telling her I didn't even know the difference between translation and interpreting. And the, this lady's telling me, and I said, I don't want to be a translator. She said, no, no, it's a sales job, you know. And I thought, oh, fantastic. And it, it helped that I did have another language because they like that, you know, for double-checking the quality of documents and, you know, and character limitations in fields and how much a language is going to expand, all that sort of stuff, interesting stuff. <laughs> and so, yeah, so it was just, purely because of the French that I came into it, but then working with a multicultural sort of team, you know, Italians, Germans, French, there, there was a little bit of everybody and I, I like that. Do you remember a, a TV series in the very early 90s or late 80s where they all, were they trading? They were trading in London. They all spoke different languages and I thought it was so glamorous. It's probably totally outdated now that'd be called capital or something Amy. i've not seen that i've not seen that but I, that might I have been that was glamorous like i don't know 30 years into my career or well, maybe not that old, 20 maybe maybe i was just too young for that you know yeah maybe you were you probably are do you know what one thing that i did want to mention when i mentioned coffee cups earlier i wanted to mention You'll know how to pronounce this properly, being in Austria. But Belzen, Belzen. I used to like a biscuit from each country. <laughs> yeah. Chocolate. A Belzen biscuit. It looks like a, a butter cake. Yes. But guess what? It's orange flavour. Mm. I'm addicted to these. I'm going to have to change my title from Jaffa Cake consumer to reading this one. See, you don't, that's not a British biscuit, is it? No, it isn't. It isn't. I've worked with a client recently in, in the biscuit field, and when I say to him, that is just not that is just not a typical English biscuit. Where would you send him with a biscuit like that? I mean, who I would have never thought. See, I'm not a fan of a custard cream. Definitely no thanks to a custard cream. Hobnob, yes. Chocolate hobnob, yes. Something with chocolate. But these are so un-British. However, they're so nice. How? Who marketed them into the British market? Unfortunately, not me. It could have been you, though, Catherine. It, it could have been me. It could have been me. But, yeah. <sighs> Susan, the biscuit lady. So. And I could just come on your live and start eating a biscuit. Well... There's most things. Team, I'm trying to do that in the new team language line. I'm trying to get we have a big sales meeting on a Thursday, it goes on forever. It's brilliant because you get to know what everybody's doing. I love it. Um, but I've started taking a box of biscuits every week. And it, and it, everybody sits there really well behaved. I sit there munching on the Jaffa cake. These are for tomorrow, really. You better stop eating them then. What are you going to do tomorrow? Or have you got a cupboard full? <laughs> oh dear. Oh dear. So what, what at the moment, or let's say, what were, the, what were the biggest challenges when you came into the languages service industry? What were the things that kind of shocked you most about it? Or what were the client statements that made you think, oh, crikey, really? What are they thinking of? 
<laughs> ah, yeah, okay. Well, first of all, the terminology was, and it was like, how will I ever understand all this? Oh, I meant to get my book out. So I've got a few pages just full of abbreviations of TMS, TM, MT. You know, it's like, oh, CMS, CRM. I'm like, what? Well, CRM is any business, but all those are not writing them down. They, they just become second nature. But I tend to not take anything for granted with a client, and I will. I sort of explain the the terminology to them as much as they need to know. That, yeah. That's condescending. Who wants someone to start talking all sorts of tech to them? As long as you can confirm you've got the right tech stack to support their work. The I think, do you know, I had a couple of things dropped on me, customers from someone that had left, and I learned fast. You learn fast when a big problem gets dropped on you. I don't know. I'm, and maybe I've got one of those faces. I've got background in customer service, so tend to be potentially more helpful than than salesy. Does right. Make yeah. Sense? Mm -hmm. There's always a sales. Well, consultative industry. is the word you're looking for, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sales. Consultative sales. And, and then ops have got to deliver it. So I'm always on oh, customer service. I've got to deal with it later. So I tend to look to the future, you know, so that I can help my team as well. I remember getting one dropped on me where a website had been localised and, and, and nobody had even bothered to ask what sort of Spanish they wanted. So, and this was a flashy website. Oh, I just caught for the complaint because finance said, why aren't they paying the bill? I said, oh, that, that seems to be my customer now. Let's have a look. Mm. <laughs> You know, that's that famous one of a volunteer is the one who didn't quite understand what was behind the question. Yes. <laughs> well, the thing is, some some things, it's, well, let's just say that it's a big thing that I learned very quickly. One, ask, ask the, you know, ask who the target market are, where they are, not just South America. It was Latin American Spanish. It just gone Latin American Spanish, which you would kind of revert to Argentinian Spanish. However... You can't take that for granted. You would say, which what's the country? Yeah. I know it sounds sounds silly. Have the convers have the conversation. Who are your customers? What level what level of customers are they? You know, who who would be the person actually reading what we're about to translate? So yeah, it was Mexican Spanish. We ended up sorting it out because it got proofread then from Latin American Spanish into Mexican. But if you're targeting the Mexican market, you know this. You need the country that you're marketing because the whole culture's going to be different. That's all part of your job, isn't it? That's why you're so close to link to what we yep. do. Yeah. No, I mean, that is definitely, I mean, if I sit and look from my days, I mean, not that I'm a, a qualified translator in any way, shape or form, although I know that, the, and I know that there's a lot of uh, language specialists who are, who are watching. I can see Beth and Alison and I saw Catherine Bosman earlier um so there's a lot of people who who understand you know because they've got more than one language so they understand the difficulties of of translating but i think a lot of customers they don't they don't quite appreciate that do they they think it's they underestimate firstly the difficulty and secondly yeah. the amount of time that they need for those kind of projects they just go for well just you just put it through your software don't you and it spits it out yeah, well, they they think they'll think that that we it's is seamless. It's it's affordable. Let's say someone will spend, you know, they see how much a website costs to create, and then you're talking a fraction of that. For, you know, it is affordable. It's seamless to get that into a into a target language. However, before you even get anywhere close to that, it's going through someone like you to say, hmm, you know, so where would where would we want to aim? At? Our product, yeah, Where, where's that going to appeal? With me? I think you mentioned you've got some brilliant newsletters and blogs, so they would, you know, that when you talk about don't just go to a trade show and someone someone be interested in uh, I don't know Azerbaijan. I don't know why I say that, but so let's let's get the website in that language. You know, it's, it's, have a look, have a look, do some research, apparently. So the start of the is twenty. Five percent of internet users are English speakers, so yeah. over over four billion active internet users. I think one and a half would be, what is it, entrepreneur online? That's all. This one and a half billion would be 
in China and India alone, and, that, and that's not that's not two languages. That's more than two languages, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that that is what people underestimate the importance of it because it's one thing. It's not just that. It's one thing to actually understand a website. It's another thing that if it's really easy, if it's delivered to you in your own language, then you as a consumer are more likely to buy, aren't you? Than no. if it's. Yeah. I mean, you know, like. If we understand a French website or we understand a German website or whatever, and maybe if I'm lucky, I'll understand something out of a Chinese one. But if you present me with a website that's in my language and I can read all of the details and I understand what you're trying to tell me and I feel like this is, this is properly addressing me, it's not just addressed in Google Translate English, then yeah. I'm more likely to buy from it than if I have that feeling of, well, I'm not sure if I've really understood this. So maybe I'm going to click buy on something that I haven't, that isn't quite what I'm looking for. Uh, no, well, that's a valid point. You need to be able to, I can't remember if it's a similar point to be not long since. You need, you do need to understand what the product is in the small print. And, and uh, the thing is, that's where, where localization comes in, isn't it? It's having yeah. that. You know that quick turnaround, and if you think, I think, I think the stats are seventy percent. Is it seventy percent? Let's say I think it's for fashion and fashion industry. Seventy percent of their traffic comes from outside of the UK. Yeah. So what if those people are wanting to look? You know what? You know you would always. You know those charts where they do the sizes: UK, Europe. Oh. I mean, who, mm -hmm. who brought that pair of shoes that's the wrong size? Come on, we've all done it. We <laughs> and uh, so you're going to put the size chart to target the market that you're looking at. So why wouldn't you just put it in their language? It's a fraction of the price. It's it's, it's, an, it's an affordable option to localise that because you are missing out. If it What was it, 20? So if it's only 20, you're missing out on 75% of your market, potentially. Okay. 25% for English speakers. Let's say even if you add another 25%, that's another 25% of sales. You've doubled your sales, haven't you? Exactly, exactly. And actually, when uh, before I got married, I was having really big problems trying to find a pair of shoes because my feet are different sizes and I wanted something flat and wedding shoes are not usually very flat. And I was visiting a client in Taiwan and they said to me, well, just buy them in Taiwan. It'll be no problem. And I was just like, well, you know, that's easier said than done. And so we stood in the office, me with the two ladies who were involved at my importer at the time, me with my shoes off. And they, in summer, you know, summer. you know, not what I would want to do. And they were drawing around my feet on two sheets of A4 so that they got one left foot and one right foot. And they sent it to this this company that they had where they'd picked out or where they'd given me a couple of designs and said, is this what you're looking for? And they sent it to the, um, they sent it to the brand and said, we don't know what size she needs, but this is the outline of her feet. Do you know those are the, like shoe, the, the, those are the shoes I wore those. for my wedding. And they fitted, you know, Cinderella style. Okay, that reminds me of, you know, when you, when you were a kid, did your mum take you to, to get a pair of new school shoes? It Clarks is in the picture. Clarks. Yeah, exactly. It was like that. <laughs> it was like that, but a bit more primitive. That's really so. cool. Do you, can you still get that if you're going to shop in Taiwan now? Then? I don't know, because it was an online store. So. Ah. Mm. So, yeah. Worked out quite That's well. Cool story. I like that. But, you know, I couldn't have bought it myself because they didn't have it. They didn't have their website localised at that time. Really? So maybe they do now. Who knows? And if yes. they don't get in touch. <laughs> yes. And <laughs> what's who's this then? Yes, I think Alison. Alison is saying we that the huge language difference between the UK and the US. So even though that we're basically English language speakers, we are genuinely two countries divided by a common language. Definitely. Definitely, except we say nappy instead of diaper, and we say rubbish instead of trash. Loads That's of things, aren't there? Localization, yep. isn't it? Into into pants. 
pants. See, for us, that's that, that's underpants, isn't it? Yep. I once mm-hmm. convinced my sister that the word underpants was German. I was going, Hun, yeah, underpants. <laughs> she believed me. I think I bet, did I try and get her? The, oh, some other random things you probably don't want to know. I think it was to do with a jam butty, but never mind. Hmm. I don't wish to know about jam butties and jokes in German. I'm not sure that that would work. That would go into well, very... jokes are another thing, aren't they? They're hard to localise. <laughs> definitely, definitely. And I think that that is definitely something that people, they don't realise that there's a difference between localising, for example, an instruction book. I was going to say an instruction book on how to use a kettle but using a kettle at this week is probably a bad joke for the UK um an instruction book on how to use some piece of equipment that you've bought is one thing that's something that's fairly straightforward to translate if you've got the technical ability but all that kind of um marketing translations advertising translations puns all of those kind of things are just a complete nightmare so how How would you recommend that people or companies really go about selecting the right language specialist for their needs? Because, I mean, there are companies out there who specialise in certain industries. There are people out there who specialise in certain languages. Um, What kind of questions should companies be asking if they're looking for a new language service provider? Yeah, it's really relevant because... There are, there are, there's a lot of language service providers out there. We all tend to, we will all offer, we kind of all offer everything. Right, I'll try and break it down and answer it properly because there's so much to say. Firstly, I'd, I'd check with a few, have a chat with people, see who you get on with because they're going to be your single point of contact. I think that's a big thing, a personal relationship. Then the, the main things, do they have the right tech stack? You know what? Do they have the right translation management system? Not that you really need to be aware of that, of that, but you know, how are the file sharing? Is it secure? Do they have the relevant ISOs? Have they explained translation memory and how that works to you? So just ask those few questions. I mean, I do, I think. I had a white paper somewhere about, you know, the questions to ask for an actual bid. So I'd be happy to help yep. everybody with that if they wanted to. That's a lot more. We don't need to go into that really today. You know, because it is affordable, it is seamless, and it's we it's managed. Just make sure it's managed. Just make sure there are no hidden charges. Just say, does PM look after this, and how will, you, how will you deliver it back to me? And in return, just pay attention to the questions they're asking about your content. Because yep. I've opened up my style guide, which I like to go through with the customer. It doesn't take long, but I like to go through it. You know, just for, ex- for example, like for a website, are there any character limitations? Taking into account the expansion of test text. Do you, do you know, you all know that when you've heard that thing, oh, you didn't say that. You know, somebody will say something to me in English, and I'll say it across to someone in French, and they'll say, you didn't say exactly what I said. I did just seemed a lot longer because that's what happens in French. <laughs> we know that. Not everybody does. Um, but it's like, yeah, so we'd ask for examples of previous translations that might have gone wrong. We'd ask them to give us, you know, have you got editable images? Are you putting screenshots in there that have got words on? We need editable mm. images. You know, what format do you want this back in? These are all my, I mean, they're quite in-depth questions, but it's more, more about... Let's create gloss, glossary if your content is really yep. industry specific. Obviously, we'll leave your brand name. Imagine your brand name is, I don't know, Str- Strike. I don't know. I don't know why I said that, but so that can be translated. It is a word. So, you know, make sure you're looking at yeah. brand names that are standing out. What's the tone of voice? Can they give us sort of brand guidelines, reference points? All reference mater- material helps the linguists that we choose, because it's all down to the choice of linguists. Because yeah. you've got human translation, you've got machine translation that's post-edited now, that is much better than it than it was. You've got so many options to fit the right budget, to get the right, you know, your shop front 
you, you don't want to mess about with that when you build that brand integrity. So yeah. just make sure, make sure that the equivalent of me, whoever you're going to, make sure they're asking you the right questions. Make sure you get along with them. Do they respond to your emails quickly? Do they leave you for days? Do they not pick the phone up? And that, that could be a red flag for later on. Make sure you get on with someone that's not going to leave you in the lurch. Yeah. No, I think that that's, that's important, that if you... You don't want to you don't want to have as a business partner, especially if it's a bigger project and you're thinking, well, I'm only translating into one language now, but it might be 10 in future or 15 in future, Mm -hmm. then. It's probably going to make sense to have one provider who can do all of that. So you've got consistent style across everything. But also it makes it even more important, doesn't it, that you're working with somebody who you don't mind that you're happy to work with and not just somebody that you're working with because just because they gave you the best price. Yep. And, uh, you know, the example I gave you about something that went wrong, you would be surprised that the way I sorted that problem out. And uh, this is me saying I was good on that occasion. I, I like to think I do my best. I'm not saying I always get it right. But on that occasion... They came back, they paid the bill, and they, they came back with more work because they knew they could count on us if anything went wrong. Yes. Yeah. To me, it's, things don't often go wrong. If they do wrong, what happens? Do people want to brush that under the table or do they want to take responsibility and say, we'll deal with that and we'll deal with it promptly? Because industry standard, there are ways, you know, there are things in place that... that you know, if there, are, if there are quality problems or things, often a quality problem, I bet you know this, Catherine. Often. So you might have subject matter experts. So we've translated something and then you've given it to the guy in the French office and he's gone, that's wrong, that's wrong, oh, that's wrong, that's wrong. And then when you get back and you quality check it, if you've asked the right questions in the first place, you should be all right. You shouldn't get that feedback. If you haven't, people confuse a quality error with a preferential difference i use i like to use shovel and shovel and spade as you know it could be that it's the same instrument you dig with a spade you shovel with a shovel but one of them's a little bit more rounded it's actually the same instrument yeah not it's it's just a very specific and to be honest a lot of with that particular example shovel and spade a lot of native speakers use them interchangeably whereas actually they are different things Oh, see, that's professional, isn't it? It's not a good example. I need to find a better one, don't I? Because it's, it's, it's one of them more pointed. You know, we, everybody had a garden spade when we were kids, and now it, we don't really tend to have it. It's it's the pointy one, isn't it, that'll dig a better hole? Goes in easier, I guess. Maybe, yeah, maybe. Who knows? I might have to go look up the etymology on that. <laughs> <laughs> So what I don't think I'm answering your questions, you know, or I'm just waffling. Hopefully, hopefully it's interesting. <laughs> I don't know. Is anybody still there? Yeah, there are. Beth there Alexander. Are. And and Alison. Or is Alison I mean, gone? I, I guess Alison's got to go. Yeah. Alison's Alison's favorite favorite difference between between UK and US English is this one. <laughs> what is it? Let's garden. Garden. Mm-hmm. Oh, God. because that's, gosh, that's you know, like garage, garage or garage. Well, I'm no, because you see, if you say to me, "What is my garden?" then I would say, "I've got a big garden out the back." But that yeah. for an American is the yard. The garden that's is nice. literally just where I've planted my vegetables. Well, it's literally only a plot for Ooh, garden. They do say yard, I know that, but I never knew that they actually specifically used the word garden just for planting. LinkedIn user, <laughs> this is Zineb. Zineb. <laughs> Zineb. I see. Settings a bit different. To, I think it's privacy settings, you know, that does that. Uh, Eric at the Burrito told me that if it comes up LinkedIn user, it's something to do with the, you know, your privacy settings, and there's that <laughs> many of them. Uh, I think there's people lurking. I'd love just. For me and Catherine today, a LinkedIn lurker, if you've never put a comment on a live, just do it. Tell us where you are. Just say I'm lurking. Tell us where, yeah, tell us where you are. So many lurkers, I love it. Before before we start 
mudslinging about other areas that I mean we've have we have we poked fun, we've poked fun at the French I haven't I've been very polite about Yorkshire up until now because well it seems like you know the be polite about for once about, about Yorkshire do you know I was reading earlier just for you an, art, an article about Yorkshire and Lincolnshire because I thought I best I best have a look and it was a Yorkshireman that had written it who lives in Lincolnshire strangely and he was saying that there's, there's so much so much more about Lincolnshire that people don't realise. And you know why you don't know? Because was Yorkshire folk go every, everywhere going, God's own country, we're from Yorkshire, this is good about Yorkshire, that's good about Yorkshire. From Lincolnshire, you're more humble. You don't need to shout about it. Apparently it's got the biggest array of independent restaurants and cafes because, you know, like it's so, it's so big and quite rural. Yeah. The, the big, you know, you're not going to get the big chains of wanting to go there, which is a good thing. Keeping it local, keeping it independent in Lincolnshire. Ah, well, there is, according to family tradition, I almost ran the risk of being born the wrong side of the river, being born north of the river. My dad had this idea briefly it that it would be that that were I to be born north of the river in Yorkshire, as it was at the time, because it was before Humberside then it wouldn't have it would have given me the best start in life were i to be born a boy because then i would have been able to play cricket well i would have been able to play cricket anyway obviously in lincolnshire <laughs> but my chances of having the best career path via yorkshire county like cricket you. would have been killed yeah, but we've always we've that's always been said when i lived in france and i mean i don't have any children at the time when we're thinking about it, I, I said, if I have a baby, it'll have to be born in Yorkshire so it can play cricket for Yorkshire. That's the thing that we say. How random is that? <laughs> Definitely. But luckily, I was born safely south of the river and therefore Lincolnshire never, yellow belly. I never played Fishhead. For... Fishhead. Bom the, now, Bomber County comes from the, the fact, were the 50 bomber bases in there during the... Or more, maybe. I don't know. Unbelievable numbers. Yeah. Yep. Well, We're flat, up against the coast. It? It's flat. flat. We're up against the coast. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's, no, I'm like asking you questions. Like, I'm just watching, wandering around your life like I own the place. How dare I? <laughs> <laughs> eh, no. Those are the I was things. Honestly, they... what else was I going to say about... Um... I saw something else about Lincolnshire, but about cricket. I lived in a town called Todmorden, Todmorden, however you want to say it, on the Lancashire. Well, actually, the county line went through the middle of Todmorden. Lancashire, there's another rivalry for you. Lancashire, mm -hmm. And that, you could be dancing with your partner in the town hall and they'd be in Lancashire and you'd be in Yorkshire. Uh, but that's the only Yorkshire cricket club that plays in the Lancashire League. There you go. It's got a white and a red rose on there. Mm. Random yeah. fact of the day. Everybody everybody gets to learn something on a LinkedIn Live with the two of us. Mm -hmm. We haven't had a lurker, have we? In case I still struggle. It's C. <laughs> it's C. I don't know quite why. Have you met Beth Alexander? She's a, she, she's a true Britannian. She's a talented photographer. She's nice. She's such a nice girl. We'll have to meet one day. I wonder one day I've had a really big party with everybody from LinkedIn. I wonder where we'd have that if we had a big LinkedIn party, Catherine. Mm, good question. Good question. Everybody I think taller, much taller, apart from me, I'm not tall. But when you meet people, they're always so much taller. And I'm, I'm fairly tall, but I'm the smallest one in our family. How tall are you? Well, I'd say. Uh, five eight. See, I'm about five foot five and a half, maybe five foot five five. Uh, that no, in, for for anybody who would like it in centimeters, I'm about one seventy three, one seventy four. I'm about one sixty. We're localizing the. See, we're localizing for everybody. Yeah. So what, James James wants to know the differences between. <laughs> the differences between Yorkshire and Lincolnshire. I would say yes, there are differences. I'm not quite sure whether I can explain. 
it's a tough one, isn't it? I you see personally being from your I'm from Halifax, which is West Yorkshire. Um I'd say that anybody from Lincolnshire sounds a lot posher than we do. <laughs> I would say because that's I, I would just say that's because Lincolnshire's more at market than Yorkshire, but you know <laughs> probably we, we got be, restaurants. See, we restaurants. could be about to descend into <laughs> into slinging slinging local insults around the place. But, well, yeah. we were all street urchins and lived in clogs in, uh, in that, you know, up that mines. I can put a proper Yorkshire accent on if I want, but no one would understand me. No one would understand me. So, yes, if we all met, everybody would be. There's a guy called Andy Griffiths on LinkedIn. I'm sure you connected to him. When I, I met him. I were up in Brema. I went for a drink. Me and my husband and dogs. I think was, the dogs were a bit better, though. Anyway, Andy said, does it feel like meeting famous people? I said, oh, no, I don't think you're famous, Andy. But in a way, it's kind of like this weird meeting someone that you've known for such a time on on social media well i call it business social media because it's yeah but it is it is very nice though when you do get to meet people i met i've met a few people this year i met um who have i met i met sue todd and in morpeth well not in morpeth i met her in cramlington and who else have i met mick armstrong also, we met up in the northeast, and I also met up with Kirkendy, uh, Kimberly Kirkendall, who visited Austria in the summer. So, you know, it's been nice. I, and I also met Catherine Busman last year as well. So that was really very, very nice. Oh, definitely. You know, Those for you, it's going to be more difficult because you're in you're in Austria. Yeah. So a lot of your connections are are exporting their businesses out of the UK, aren't they? To you, have, you yep. have, before they even thought about a localization expert like me they come to a, a global consultant like you to say which markets are right and how's the best way to get in them Have I got maybe that, that would be the ideal way to work out where you ought to be going with your business rather than just saying let's go to france because it's the closest or because i learned a bit french in school mm -hmm. and or because I'd like to go to, I'd like to go, where could we go? We'd like to go to Cannes for some kind of festival. So, <laughs> oh, that's a really you know. bad reason. That's a very bad reason. That's like me wanting to visit a town and, and, and just looking for a client in that town. So, I can go there. so you can justify going there. <laughs> you and a global consultant and local agent. That's the only way to get a competitive edge, isn't it? Definitely. And Realistically speaking, if you, you know, if you want to do something, go with an expert and somebody who knows about the market that you're going to. You don't want to go with somebody or you don't want to just try and build everything yourself when you don't actually have the competence or you don't actually know how to build a brand and how to build a presence in different oh, markets. <laughs> Stand on a piece of A4 paper and draw around your foot if you want some shoes. <laughs> yes, and going back to the topic of, of, of how tall various people are, Catherine Busman and I, we realised how much taller I am than she is last year when she came to visit, <laughs> which of course you don't realise we've met often on Zoom and obviously on Zoom you don't realise quite how down. You just don't realise how people, how tall people are or not. So I said, I'm stood up, you don't even care in time that small, I'm stood up. <laughs> the I'll tell you there was one on his um it's Russell Dow Glee from the Scottish Business Network. I bet he knows loads of people to send you away, Catherine. He is he put thing on his six foot six or something. Not the guys in the net zero group at all. You know, well over six foot. When I met Gavin and um and James from Net Zero Nation, I'm like, I had a crick in my neck at the end of the day because I'm so I'm probably full foot below them and i don't wear heels anymore because what's the point you know yep uh, yeah yeah there we go subject, be making when you speak to a professional like you or a, a localization expert as there are plenty you had um cu customer engagement has got to be a priority because that that is you if you get ahead customer engagement's already your priority isn't it yeah 
And I think, and I think that a lot of people think that they're going to save money by not going with a professional service <laughs> provider, but actually, you know, the time that you save and the quality that you increase on your on your offering, it just more than makes up for the fact that you've cut the corners. I mean, it's not it's not cheaper, is it, to try and do everything? There are things you can do yourself, mm. and there are things that you just shouldn't touch with a barge pole. Yeah, I mean, say if you've got speakers, I was talking about this to Carl last week. If you have got language speakers in your team, please, by all means, save them for a final review yeah. of the content before it goes live, and, and and feed that back to your language service provider who will update your translation memory according to your needs to apply to future ones. That's your intellectual property. It just gets stored securely. But, you know, the localization, it's a lot more affordable than you think. It is seamless. You will have a single point of contact. It is managed. It's efficient. It's productive. Well, did, what do they say? If you pay cheap, you pay twice. And literally, you will. We, we pick up stuff that has to be redone. It's, yeah. I mean, that's good. You know this. See, you know this. I'm, I'm yeah. sure that well and i was about to say there we go boys and girls this is the lesson of the day and when a yorkshire lady says to you it's better to put the money in you take the money <laughs> and to pay money to somebody specialist in order to do it well then you know that this is money well spent <laughs> well yeah. invested you know people like to say we're tight in yorkshire and then the worst is and then you're living scottish. in scotland well, yeah exactly my husband's scottish so we're, we're very thrifty thrifty i like to say you're careful where you invest your pennies. Exactly. You, all, all we want is the, the money that we work hard to get. Because mm -hmm. we want to know that, it's, that we spent it wisely. No, nobody likes to be, well, the fund is money are easily parted. Definitely. Right. Yes, um, that's one of those nice sayings, isn't it? So. <laughs> I love sayings like that and where they come from. And... Yeah, and how they've arisen over the mm -hmm. years. Mm. anyway i think that we are from a time perspective coming a little bit to the end because otherwise we will we will just descend into slinging discussions and stories and exchanging <laughs> things no. so my final question to you sorry i think we've been well behaved up to now i think we have there hasn't been any swearing and there hasn't been anything that i you know that we shouldn't have said in public so we haven't told any stories that we shouldn't have told in in the public domain i don't think so i think we're good um when you were starting out in international mm. business or if you look back to when you were starting out what piece of advice would you give yourself now knowing what you do what do you wish you'd known when you were starting out that was a bit of a cockeyed way of phrasing yeah, my no, sentence wasn't it but no that's that's Perfect. Let me think. Well, you see, a lot of people, um, I've not been asked that specifically. I mean, one of me would have said, telling myself wouldn't have been any good because back in the day, I knew everything. So I didn't listen. So probably the advice would be to, to ask questions and listen. Don't be afraid to ask the daft questions. And, and, and also, you know, if you want a career, in either international business, it's so exciting. Don't settle for, don't settle for this or that. Go out, ask questions. Do you know what? Be positive. Be positive. Do your research. Go out and be positive. Ask questions, and don't be scared to maybe take a year abroad. I'm not saying some people bills. You know, we all have bills to pay, but it's, and don't be scared of taking a little bit of risk. To, to say, I want to go and learn another culture, because at the base of this, at the base of your work, and ours to, a, to an extent, is, is culture, isn't it? And it's not about learning just another language, it's about learning another culture. So I'd say, I'd say, ask a lot of questions. Don't be scared to to give something a go that might not be what you, you expected it to be. <laughs> Yeah, not, not just that, but I think just being open to other cultures and going out there and having that adventure, isn't it? It gives you a lot. Even if you learn what it is that you don't want to do, it's you've still had huge yeah. benefits. Open, open up to other cultures. I mean, we talk a lot about inclusive language. Be be open to other people's opinions, and you will go so much further. You you'll be a lot happier for it, as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's an extra skill for you for for the next step. Mm -hmm. that's what i'd say 
How dead yep. serious today, huh? Oh, we're very, we're very good today, aren't we? <laughs> anyway, Susan, thank you for joining me today. It has been lovely to chat as ever. And I it. Thank you, Catherine. I'm really delighted that you asked me. And yeah. I shall look forward to chatting with you again at some point. Anybody who has missed this, please feel free to comment all the way through or to go back and watch it on YouTube. It will also be on LinkedIn, of course, and we will talk to you next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye.